Vlog day 409. Today is a right early Wednesday, as far as you're concerned. It's Tuesday for me. I'm gonna do, uh, I, I'm not gonna go anywhere for a bit. I'm gonna stay here and try to write. I do need uh, to get some supplies though. I have toilet paper. I also uh, would love to get a coffee at you decide because they're back open now, supposedly. So we're gonna go for a walk. And I thought that today, it's weird for me. I had a good talk last night with Rick and Vanessa about kind of how they engage with the vlog and things that they're hoping for, which was really helpful. Some of the things that I'm feeling particularly vulnerable about, I uh, will work up to. Uh, one of the things that they said they're very interested in is hearing more about my dating life which they're not alone. There are a lot of you that would like to hear about that. We can talk about that at some point here soon, to some degree, but of course, to protect the innocent and not so innocent, I'm definitely going to have to remove names and places from uh, the stories. I don't want to Taylor Swift myself, yeah, believe it or not. But one of the things I haven't really talked much about are the books that I've already written, and part of that's because some of the books that I've already written, I've unpublished three of them because they really were not good enough and need to be revised, they need to be reworked. And a few of them, like this one right here is the one I was thinking about. It's like covered in dust. This is Dark Horse. One of my, it's like fourth book, something like that. Sorry about the construction noises outside. And this is actually my copy, this is a proof copy. You'll notice that the text on the title is way smaller than the final version ended up being. I kind of thought that maybe today we could talk about how I interact with music when I write. Because music for me is wildly important for my creative process. And I think it's part of the reason why I inter I'm, I'm very different about music and I, I hardly care at all about uh, lyrics, which is weird as a writer. I'm all about melody and harmony. So maybe we can talk about that today. We'll talk about one scene from this book, uh, which would obviously go better if you'd read it, but I think you'll get the idea anyways. So for those of you who have read this, maybe this will be really interesting for you. For the rest of you, I hope it's interesting. See, I have, hold on, I, I pulled this, I pulled this from this pile of, of books that I've written. These are the three that I have unpublished. You can't get anymore. Uh, Into the Nanton, you can read online for free. Shadows of the High Ridge is kind of a tie between these two, and Dark Horse is a standalone completely. You can see how much dust is gathered on all this stuff, though I haven't touched it in a while. Maybe we should talk a little bit about what I write before we talk about how I write. That was kind of the plan actually originally on the editorial calendar. It's just that talking about the music side of things feels a little uncomfortable for me and I'm gonna try and push myself into those areas all the more whenever I run into them. But what I write is science fiction and fantasy. Predominantly fantasy. Everything that you can actually buy from me right now is fantasy. I have two sci-fi books sitting on a shelf waiting to do something with them. Uh, one of them is finished. The other one's Agnar's Box. That's the one that I'm working on. So the one that's finished is a post-apocalyptic, kind of like Mad Max Fury Road meets The Imitation Game. Maybe that way. Uh, Agnar's Box is basically, if you could imagine, it's a near future sci-fi horror. And if you can imagine the setup being Indiana Jones and Tony Stark getting together to create a company based off of the relics that Indiana Jones brought back and then Tony Stark, you know, weaponizes them and whatever else. And then they disappear on the search for a relic that they don't even believe exists. It's kind of the setup for that one. So yeah, it's basically what I write more or less. for talking, is it? Sometimes I avoid saying you in French, like when I have conversations like with that guy. I'm not sure, do I say tu or vu sometimes, and so I'll just avoid saying anything like that. It's hard, like I wait till they say it, I say vu or tu, and I'm like, oh, okay, that's what I'll say. We just ran into another street cleaner. This is, uh, bad luck all around. I do like a little sugar in my coffee though, not a lot, but I don't know, I like sweet drinks, what can I say? So writing is something I obviously really enjoy, something I love, it's also something that's really ridiculously difficult, and so I don't always enjoy it as much as I should, or otherwise would, but I do have my moments where I'd rather not. <laughs> And right now I need to get back to it. I have other work to do. Today was a really slow start. I stayed up really late editing and uh, 
just let myself sleep in because I knew that I would need it. And there's other stressors that I would like to talk about. I'm working on it. I'm working on getting to the point where I can be a little bit more open with you guys about a few things, but we'll get there. Uh, but in the meantime, on the writing side, if you were to look at my Spotify playlist, you know the saved songs playlist? Mine would make very little sense, I feel like. It's, there's, there's some themes to it, for sure. Um, but it's not necessarily even the most popular music. It's just music that inspires scenes or inspires moments that I would like to write. And more often than not, I end up saving songs that kind of elicit an emotion that it's like, I would like to capture this in writing at some point. But it's probably just an emotion that I experience. So that's the, that's the trick is to try and translate that to the written word. I'm not the only one that's uh, short on toilet paper. Yikes. Success. Anyways, for me, when I'm listening to music, there's something that triggers my imagination with certain songs where I start like seeing things, imagining, not seeing things like as in like having visions, but just imagining scenes and sequences playing out. And then it kind of helps to refine an idea that I already have or sometimes to inspire something completely new. And the song that I was going to talk about with Dark Horse is one of two songs that really inspired the entire story. Specifically what I'm talking about is the one that plays out over the main character's dream sequence, the sequence of events that play out in his dreams. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I, I don't know how well it'll translate just by kind of sharing it, but I can kind of give you an idea of how it would play out if you were to listen to that song and see the dream almost as like a music video. I think it's a fair way of looking at it. And then maybe we'll do the actual, like the breakdown of what I write and why I write what I write next week. Cause that's what I was planning for this week, but eh, we'll just bounce it around. Let me know if you're interested, I suppose. Now, for those of you who are still with me, I'm gonna give you a little bit of context uh, because I think that before we get into it, it's good to have a couple images in your head so I don't have to try and describe everything as music is playing. And the second thing, I've linked to Florence and the Machine's Cosmic Love below. So go ahead and click on that, open that up and get it ready. Pause it right at the um, at zero. It's a four minute long video, pause it at zero. We're both gonna click play at the same time and I will describe to you as best I can what's going on in my head that correlates to the music in kind of a cinematographic version, I guess. It'd be a lot better if we could actually do like a storyboard or something for it, but we'll work with what we've got. So get that going, put in one earbud like so, and then you can hear both me and that. You might have to use two separate devices to make this work. I believe in you, I think you can do it. So this is again, the dream sequence out of my book, Dark Horse. And I also want to preface this by saying this is really weird for me and I'm kind of excited to do it now that I've listened to the song a few times to kind of get back into it. And that's helped me to forget just how like terrifying this is. So it really feels like I know that writing is a really vulnerable thing and I've already put this into story format, but it makes me feel like, <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm a little bit less worried about it now than I was, but leading up to this, I was feeling like, wow, this is really letting you guys in to see kind of the creative process, but also just like to see how incredibly lame I am, potentially. <laughs> without further ado, and without talking myself out of it, I'm gonna go ahead and play this uh, and describe for you what's going on. So the context going into it, this is a dream. So we'll start, you know, with him lying in his uh, hay stuffed mattress. I think is when he has it. He has a dream multiple times, so we can start with him wherever you want him to be. And for the full version of it, the full dream, he's actually sleeping on some rocks. So whatever. So it's our, our guy who's sleeping on some rocks and we'll hear his heartbeat as he falls asleep and see the stars above him that he's sleeping underneath. And then one of those stars transitions into a yellow flame, which is a torch. We see it twinkling because he's riding through the forest. We can see it, we can't see it between the leaves, okay? So that's kind of how that starts out. The geographic location is that as he's riding through the forest, there are huge dramatic mountains on his left, the ruins of a giant castle in front of him, and the ocean crashing up against the rocks and cliffs off to the right, as well as behind the castle. So the castle's built on the coast, nestled up against the mountains with a long bridge or wall heading out into some other rocks where there's another tower built out. And that is his goal, is that tower. And I think with that, we can go from there. And just imagine for color palette purposes, everything is cast in nothing but white light. It's at night and you have moonlight. Everything is white. Uh, and actually, I think even in the dream, in this part, in this time period in my world, there are two moons. So you can imagine two moons um, casting crisscrossing shadows everywhere. And I think that adds a little bit something to it. Uh, so there's those two things. And then the only color, the only source of color is the flame that he's carrying with him. And that's just kind of the visual that's important. As for him, the boy's wearing some armor when he falls asleep, but in the dream, he's wearing this full suit of black armor. And he actually looks fairly 
wicked, right? Like he looks like a badass, but it's kind of like, you're not sure if he's good or bad. So I think that's important, riding a black stallion up to a black castle and working his way in through the white light of the moon. Um, yeah, and I think that's good. So with that, if you're ready to hit play, I'm gonna hit play. I'm gonna listen to it, like I said, and I'm going to just kind of walk you through what goes on in my imagination as I hear the song and uh, what I end up ultimately trying to capture and put on paper. And maybe someday Florence and the Machine will see this and they'll be like, let's make a music video together. And I'll be like, sweet, that'd be great. Without further ado, I'm hitting play right now. So we can hear the heartbeat. Okay. This is hard. This is really, really hard. I'm gonna, I already, I just messed this up a little bit. Uh, so I'm gonna try one more time and then we'll go either way. I just, I, in doing it, I forgot a word, which is bridal. Anyways, let's try this again. I'm hitting play. Okay, so we hear the heartbeat of him. He's kind of injured, lying on the stone, looking up at the stars, and then they transition into a dream, and we see a star fall, and it comes down, and then we see a transition into it, flickering into red and orange as it becomes a torch riding through the forest. And as we pan down, or as we crane down, we see the mountains rise in the distance with the ruins of the castle in front of him, and this ocean crashing off in the distance. He comes out of the forest, on his horse, and as he comes up to the ruined bridge, he jumps off, the horse lands in the dust and walks through the dry, brittle grass towards the bridge. He leaves his horse behind, makes his way across, and enters through the main gates into a courtyard that's ruined. As he walks through, we see the, sun, the moonlight coming down, casting, crisscrossing shadows, like I said, and he works his way up the long, ruined set of stairs, between broken statues until he pushes into the great doors. He works his way through the he works his way through the hallways, exploring as he goes, and we start seeing color cast onto things that haven't been seen in a generation, banners and tapestries and paintings, but his torch can't really reach out all the way into the darkness. And as he walks through, we start seeing shadows moving around him, right? Creatures that may be men, demons, we don't know, wandering through the, the ceilings and along the walls, watching him and following him. And as he gets to the main doors to the throne room, they drop and they attack. He defends himself, he's using his sword to fight them off, but also doing the best that he can to protect the torch, the only flame that he has, the only source of light, and the source of life in the story. He fights his way in and through them and into the courtyard, or into the throne room, where he finds a throne at the top of a long set of stairs with water, what looks like water running through an intricate waterwork system around the outside and down the hall. He fights his way up the stairs and they're getting closer and closer, coming at him from every angle. They could be men, they could be gargoyles, they're just demons or monsters of some sort, flinging themselves at him. And as he desperately fights them off and trips and stumbles back, he realizes that what's running in the water isn't necessarily water, he knows what it is. And so he desperately throws the torch and in slow motion, we see the torch tumbling end over end towards the liquid. The monsters around the room changed uh, their focus away from him and they focus in on the torch, on the flame. Their rage and their fury transitions into terror and fury as they fling themselves towards the torch, desperately reaching out with their clawed hands as it bounces off the step and then manages to tumble into the liquid. Everything goes dark and then it erupts in flame. He uses that as his opportunity to flee as the monsters freak out and start you know, fleeing as well. He gets up a long set of stairwell, a long stairwell that's hidden behind the, the throne and makes his way to the very top, where on the bridge in front of him is one last contender, a huge monster with a giant battle ax that comes at him roaring. He fights with that and it has the momentum behind him. He has the confidence, even though it's a desperate fight. He manages to kill it, lopping its head off and jumping over it and making his way up the tower at the end. He races up the stairs to find the woman that he's there to try and save, this raven-haired beauty, of course, who turns around and they embrace, right? Right about here. There's a lot of running still going on, I guess. And then they embrace and you hear, you can hear like the little pops and cracks as the castle in the background begins to explode and you have these huge balls of flame as life is brought to the castle, right? And as evil is destroyed, they're embracing and kissing. But then as the music starts to do this twittering thing, we start jittering between different potential realities between them embracing and between him reaching out desperately for her as she falls off the edge of the tower and into the stony waters below. And that's the end of the dream. And we have the heartbeat of him being like, oh my God. And there you go. That was really intense for me. Maybe super boring for you guys, but Jiminy Christmas. I can't believe I'm sharing this. Um, so anyways, hopefully that, 
hopefully that made sense of some sort. You can go back and try and get the timing right. It's really hot in here. I need to turn the fan back on. But yeah, I think I'm gonna go for a run. I'm really feeling kind of antsy and agitated and I uh, want to get out and run before Jenica gets in and then hopefully I can go see Jenica. She's got the energy to see me. And then I gotta edit and get some sleep because tomorrow morning I'm going to Versailles. So that is the plan. Sorry that we have hardly left this place uh, today. I know that's, let's go, let's go for a run. That'll be a little bit more visually stimulating at least. <laughs> Just under a nine minute pace, or right around a nine minute pace. Not too shabby. Feel a little bit better. Had a lot of time to think. Thoughts. Around the way, uh, Jenica did get in and we're gonna go hang out, grab some falafel it sounds like, and then I'm not gonna get any sleep again tonight because I still need to edit. So yeah, we're gonna talk more about the thoughts that I'm having this week and soon. Don't worry, they'll come. This is one of those things, I have to kind of work myself into it. Jenica said to bring a bag because she has some small things for me, among which are going to be American deodorant because French deodorant don't cut it. So I'm pretty excited about that. Anyways, let's go. I'm just a little delirious right now. Founder. I put my teeth. <laughs>